What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there and it's free. As you all know, that enables us to keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you have, please tell a friend because each one teach one. We appreciate your guys' support in getting us this far. Now, today we have the honor and the privilege of being joined by one of the icons and titans of the game, Grand Wizard Theodore. Thank you for coming through, sir. Salute, salute, salute. Uh, I, I'm glad to be here. Glad to see another day, man. Glad to see another day. Yes, it's a, a lot going on in the world. So every day is definitely a blessing. Yes, yes. So, uh, so much to ask given your uh, status in the game. But one of the things that I, I've talked to Prince Whipper Whip and a lot of other people about this is that with uh, Fantastic Romantic Five, Fantastic Freaks, Fantastic Five, how did you, you guys always were switching your name. Do you remember why at the time you didn't like just stick to one or why you guys were rotating it so much? Um, we were switching our names because we were constantly uh, reinventing ourselves. Um, we were constantly um, elevating as a group, taking our, um, our, um, our show and taking ourselves to the next level. And each time that we did that, that's what made us change our names. You know? So what do you remember were the changes with each name change? Like what was well, when we became when we became fantastic, you know, a uh, 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 period. You know, it's, it's just uh, our stage presence. Everything that we did was fantastic. Um, um, the way we harmonize, the way we did our dance steps, the way we incorporate the DJ and the MCs together, and stuff like that. Um, we became a fantastic romantic five because. You know, everywhere we went, we always had the women around us. Um, all of our routines um, were, were geared toward the women, you know. Um, we loved the ladies, you know. And uh, we always had ladies around us and stuff like that. So that's why we went, 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 went to the uh, fantastic, you know, romantic. Then we became the fantastic romantic freaks. And that's when we were wearing, like, the... Um, we were wearing the leather and stuff like that. We were wearing the spikes and stuff like that. You know, that's when we started going, you know, hanging out downtown in the grill and um, Danceteria and the Roxy's and stuff like that. And, and, and that's why we became the Fantastic Freaks because we were dressing. Everybody looked at us like, like we were freaks, you know, because the way we were dressing. But, you know, we didn't care because... That was our look, take it or leave it, you know? Right. Well, I think too, obviously I wasn't there at the time, but what I've seen, read, heard about, understood, it's always interesting because I think the perception and then when I started going to shows, uh, obviously much later, but it was almost all men. There was no women around at a lot of these shows. You go to a Public Enemy show, you go to a Brand Nubian show, you go to a Heavy, well, Heavy D was a little different. But um, so for you guys, how did you, how or why did you cater to the women at a time when a lot of people didn't seem to be really going for that? Well, it's because that's what our life was all about. We always spend time around women everything that we do, you know, we, we, we stay groomed, you know, we, we wear our perfume, we make sure our clothes are clean, we make sure we have haircuts, we make sure, you know, everything we do is for women, you know, the way we dress, the way we smell, you know, everything, everything we did was for women. And when we write, when a fantastic was writing their rhymes, most of their rhymes will get towards women. And that's what we always did. You know, we, we did the Jordash, uh, Jordash jeans rhymes for the girls and stuff like that. Um, and hey, that's what it was, man. We, we always get everything towards women because there is no party without women. You know, I couldn't go to a party where it's mostly all men. 
I, you got to have some women inside the party unless either I'm not going to stay, you know, or what little bit of females is there I end up leaving with the fantastic and we go somewhere, have our own party, you know, but there's no party without women, man. Without women, there is no party. So we make sure that everything we do catered towards women. Makes sense. Okay. Um, and then as far as uh, everybody's role in the group, <clears throat> Waterbed Kev, Master Rob, Whipper Whip, could you break down the different personality and what you thought each different person of the five brought to the brought to the crew? Wow. Um, first of all, man, like putting the Fantastic Five together, you know, it, it definitely wasn't easy, you know, because I had to deal with five different personalities, you know. Um, Water Bay Kev and Master Rob, well, Water Bay Kev and I, we were in we were in third grade together. You know, that's how I met Water Bay Kev. I mean, I didn't even know that Water Bay Kev had a brother until um uh the L brothers, we were doing a party, which is my brother Cordio and my brother Mean Gene and myself. We was the L brothers and we were doing a party. And Kevy Kev and Robbie Rob came up to the ropes and was like, Kev was like, yo, like, um, can I get the mic and, and say a couple of rhymes? And I turned to my brother, Mean Gene, and was like, yo, this is uh Kevy Kev. I went to school with him, you know. He said he can rhyme with a microphone. I want to give him the microphone and let him rhyme. My brother was like, no, ain't nobody touching the microphone. My brother, Mean Gene, the, the mean and gene came out. He was like, nah, no, no. Ain't nobody touching the mic. I don't want nobody touching the mic. I was like, I mean, give him a chance. He might be, you know, he might be an asset to the, uh, you know, to us. I didn't use that word asset at that time. I was like 12, 11 years old, something like that. I didn't use the word asset, but I used the word um, like asset, you know? <laughs> so I said, he can really help us out, you know? So just give him the mic and just see what he can do. It can't hurt. So I gave him the microphone and started cutting up some, some instrumentals, cutting up some breaks, and the crowd loved them. The females loved them. The fellas was like, yo, you know, he can really, really rhyme. And I was like, yo, you know, to my brother Gene, I was like, yo, we should put Kev down with us because look at everybody loves him, man, you know? And then Kev was like, I was like, yo, come to the house and, and talk to us and see if we can, you know, make some arrangements. And Kev said, well, I got my brother, Master Rob, and Master Rob is the one that write the rhymes. And then I'm the one that say most of the rhymes. So I was like, bring your brother. And that's when we finally put um, uh, Master Rob and Wonder Bay Kev down with us. Busy B. Starsky was also down with us, too. But Busy B. Starsky was down with everybody. he go to Bronze River sometimes. he go to Disco King Mario sometimes. He just, he was down with everybody. Um, MC Ruby D lived in Davidson Projects, and we put Ruby D down with us, which is one of the first Puerto Rican MCs and stuff like that. So that's when we became a fantastic, you know? And um, once we met Whip a Whip and Dada Rock, they were the last two people we got, we put down, and which completed everything and made, made it the, uh, the other fantastic five. So Robin Kerr, what they brought to the, to the, to the, to the table was, you know, the pretty boy fly guy all the time. All the girls loved them and stuff like that. You know, I mean, the girls loved the whole crew, but, you know, when they see Rob and Kev, they were like the, the pretty boys of the crew and stuff like that. Then you had Ruby D. Ruby D was like the, the swab, the swab Puerto Rican, you know, low key MC and stuff like that. Then you had Busy B. Starsky, which was like the, the hype man. Then you had, um, uh, Whip a Whip and Dada Rock, which is the original Salt and Pepper MCs, they go back and forth and forth and back on the microphone and just make you like say, Wow, these guys are like awesome, you know, finishing each other's sentences, finishing each other's rhymes. They were like the perfect tag team. And Dada Rock was like awesome with the pen, man. The way he the way he writes his rhymes and everything, and and and, and wrote most of the rhymes for the Fantastic Five and stuff like that. Each, indi each individual brought something very, very special to the Fantastic Five, man. I was very lucky to have um, 
you know, be able to DJ for these guys, man. I was very lucky. Yeah, well, it, it was uh, amazing stuff. And obviously, sadly, I didn't see it in New York at the time, but we'll get to a lot of other things. But uh, even before that, obviously, the L Brothers and everything else, when uh, with, with scratching, needle dropping, all the things that you brought to the culture, to the, to the table, um, I, I really am always intrigued about why the sounds and the things meant what they did to you so you didn't just like leave it alone. Like it's one thing to like a sound of a scratch or something when you first were doing it, but what made you be like, that's something we could really use. <laughs> like how did that happen in your mind? Well, what made me popular was me needle dropping, me scratching, um, me being able to extend the brakes and stuff like that, you know, um, I was basically just doing something that nobody else was doing, you know, and the older I got, the more mature I got, the more my scratches started to get better and better and better and more clearer and clearer. And the more records that started to come out and the more records that I started scratching, um, just took me to a new level. As time went by, my scratches got better and better and better. My mind got more mature. And that's why everything started to evolve. And I never stopped doing it because um, new people started listening to me. Um, DJs tried to emulate me, but I was like two, three steps ahead of all the other DJs that was trying to go home and learn the scratches that I was trying to, that I was doing and stuff like that. So I think that's, you know, one of the reasons why I kept doing it. I didn't stop. And as time went by, I got better and better and better. So given that you invented this, how, <laughs> I've always been curious too, like it's mm -hmm. when you start something that doesn't exist and there's no frame of reference for it, how do you build on it once you start doing it? Like, how did you understand as time went on like oh if i scratch a drum here or i scratch a guitar there like how did it how did that process develop in your mind and in your execution well first of all let me say that um my skills as a dj um it's not it's not a talent you know it's not it's not a talent to the point where i have to practice it every day because someone Someone with a talent and someone with a gift is two different things. What I do is a gift. It's not a talent. If you have a talent, you have to keep practicing and practicing and practicing in order to improve your talent. Now, what I have is a gift that God gave me. This gift was with me since the day I was born. And I realized what that gift was at an early age. 11, 12 years old, you know, um, just by uh, loving music. Um, um, my mother had a, 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 a big thing, looked like a coffin. And when you open it up and look inside, you had the record player, you had the eight track, you had the radio and everything. And what I did was when I played her 45s and when it got to the break part, Sometimes the break is in the beginning. Sometimes the break is in the middle. Sometimes the break is at the end of the record. And when you get to the break part, what I did was I would lift the needle up and drop it back on the break, not knowing that I was developing the needle drop style because I was doing it for months, <laughs> two weeks, three weeks, a month, three months, four months, five months, not knowing that I was developing the needle drop style. And when I finally got on real turntables, the, the style was already there because I invented the needle drop before I invented the scratch. So with this gift that God gave me, the more mature my mind got, the more time went by, the more my skills became better and better and better. And everything became natural, cutting up breaks, um, instead of backspinning the record, um, lifting a needle and dropping a needle on the record 
getting it back to the spot that I wanted. And all of that was because of the gift that God gave me, you know? And by me practicing all the time, it just helped me even more, you know? Right. So, but to answer your questions, it's just a gift. My, my gift kept me going. My gift uh, took me to another level. My gift always kept me three, four steps ahead of all the other DJs that was trying to emulate everything that I was doing. Yeah. Well, that, that's clear. <laughs> Be sure to check out the History of Gangster Rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was... I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.